game. Okay. Let's go. So, um, this is the not well. Uh, just a reminder. We still um, under the um, the not well. Um, so make sure make sure you're aware of this and understand this. Um, this is the uh, series of meetings that we we are planning. So as a reminder, we still have three more to go. And uh, today is uh, mainly, mainly um, Torsten will uh, walk us through um, the PAR and and RAR, RAR presentations. So that's uh, that's our agenda. Any any comments, uh, suggestions, bashing, agenda bashing. Thank you, uh, Torsten. I will hand it to you. Thank you very much. So I'm trying to share my screen first. So can you see my presentation? It's coming. Yes. So can you see it now? Or... I, I don't see it yet. Can you see um we're getting your screen but it's blank except for your mouse cursor right yeah. now and it says terminal it looks like your terminal really okay okay, so micro... okay let's try otherwise um... yeah, try the screen also yeah you may have to just share the whole screen there you go that's working okay thank you very much justin Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So hello everybody. Um, so the first topic of today is the current status of pushed authorization requests draft. I will quickly uh, flip through the, um, the concept and then uh, present you some of the open issues that we um, currently see and that we would like to discuss with you. We, meaning uh, all the authors that you can see on the slides of Brian, Nat, Hey, Philip and myself. All right, uh, what's pushed authorization request? So basically it's a new endpoint that allows a client to, uh, instead of sending the authorization request payload through the browser, allows that clients to push that payload in a back channel direct request to the OAuth authorization server. And the authorization server in turn provides the client with a so-called request UI. This concept has been introduced by uh, the JAR drafts, which um, I think yesterday had been updated to 21. And this, this request UI is then used as the um, parameter to, to um, initiate the authorization request with the AS. This uh, PAR draft uh, supports two different modes of operation. The first one is that all the authorization request parameters go directly in the body of the PAR HTTP request, that's the uh, simple method. And there's another method where a signed or encry encrypted uh, request object uh, can be used in the R body. Both modes are exclusive, mutual exclusive. I will come back to what the differences are between those modes. So let's first quickly take a look onto how uh, Power changes the way clients use OAuth. What you can see here is a traditional OAuth request. So all the parameters are added to the request UI as UI query parameters. And PAR now takes the same parameters in more or less the same encoding and sends them via a POST request to the AS. And as you can see, because it's, it's marked in bold, this request also might be authenticated in case the client is a confidential client. So the, the, from a client developer's perspective, the, the change is not that dramatic. Instead of sending something with the URI, you send the same data uh, in a post request to the backend. Uh, but as we will see, um, the uh, consequences and the effect are pretty significant. The AS answers with a, um, a reference to the data the uh, client just uh, pushed to the back end. And this data, this request UI, is then in turn used as a reference 
to this data in the authorization request. And the authorization request parameter request UI that's being used has been defined in the JAR specification. So PAR, in the end, utilizes a parameter that was introduced with the JAR uh, specification. And the benefit um, is significant. First of all, um, there is support for large authorization requests. So a post request can basically contain more or less unlimited uh, um, data, which also means that more complex authorization requests, for example, if you use the claims parameter of OpenID Connect or the authorization details parameters that we will talk about in the next, uh, um, yeah, next presentation, uh, you can use those without any problems regarding the robustness of your um, authorization requests. Moreover, the request is protected by TLS. So transport uh, layer security gives you integrity and confidentiality protection. And at least for confidential clients, so that, that, that holds true for confidential and public clients, which is a very important aspect because you don't need to set up um, client credentials to, to, to make that happen. Uh, even for public clients. And uh, if you are using that with confidential clients, the AS is also able to authenticate the client and to authorize the client and validate the authorization request pre or start of the user interaction, which means early refusal as possible uh, before the user interaction um, has been started, which is much more robust than sending redirects back and forth. And, and that's, the, that's the, the second mode. If you use the signed request option, then PAR also gives you non-repudiation with cryptographically underpinning. The status, the current status of the draft, uh, it has been adopted by the working group. I think it was in December or in January. I, I don't remember, but around, around um, uh, this time. And thanks you, thank you very much for all uh, of you that, that voted in favor of adopting uh, the spec. And um, it's already been used in, in, in several places. So to start with, um, the financial uh, great API working group at the OpenID Foundation uh, made part, uh, part of the new um, FAPI2 baseline profile. And uh, there are quite uh, uh, several implementations uh, out in the field uh, in different uh, programming languages and different frameworks and products. And it's also already being used in, in several um, projects. So just to name a few, um, the EID system uh, in, in Norway just introduced PAR uh, as part of their solution. And we at YES also use PAR as part of our electronic signature service. And it replaced uh, the previous solution that used lodging intents, um, so typed resources uh, representing complex authorization requests with a simple, straightforward, robust mechanism. And there's also implementation planned in the Norwegian eHealth system. And as part of FAPI2, it's being proposed as part of the Australian Customer Data Rights um, Initiative. So that's a lot of things going on. Um, feedback so far is, is, is pretty good because it's a simple mechanism which really has a um, has a lot of benefits uh, from, from both and so client and, uh, and authorization server. But there are still some topics um, to be solved. There's one that was uh, raised on the list, and this is about um, yeah, a deviation between the JAR spec and the PAR spec. And um, JAR defines that the request UI must refer to a JWT. But obviously, in the case of PAR, this is not as important since the object the request UI points to is being produced and consumed by the same entity, which is the authorization server. And um, yeah, Annabelle proposed um, some wording how we could uh, more or less relax that requirement in the PAR spec, and I would like to raise that question here as well. 
So, um, Rifat, how do we handle uh, queue management and 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 uh, people's um, yeah? Yeah, they they can uh, people can queue up and we can if if that's if we have too many people. Currently, there's nobody in the queue. No. Yeah, so I I don't see anyone, but uh, they can just add themselves. Oh, there we go. There we go, Brian. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm in favor of uh, this wording that Annabelle proposed. Um, I guess it would be nice if, well, the jar seems sort of past being able to make any changes in this. This is a nice elegant way of uh, dealing with the particular policy change. So I would like to see this incorporated. When you say Brian uh, incorporated, where where would you in the uh, most likely, this has to go into the char um, document to relax those the wording a little bit, right? Well, it, it's it seems like months to just add the recent client ID. So I think that this qualification um, is a nice way to deal with it and just put it into par. There, so, so you're saying? Shoot, I'm sorry. This this would go into par. Right. Okay. And is, 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 did that answer your question? Is that? Me. Yeah. It still leaves the contradiction in place. Uh, Justin. So. Um... Another another way to deal with the contradiction, if we're not looking to actually change jar, uh, change the the wording in jar, is to use a different query parameter other than request URI, and that can reference a lot of the requirements and things that are in jar, but without using it directly. Now, I personally like the elegance of combining the solutions, but Oh, and uh, yes, yeah, sorry, this is Justin Richer. And um, I, I personally kind of like the elegance of combining those different parts of the solutions, but the truth is JAR was built at a much earlier time with different things in mind. And uh, therefore we get ourselves into kind of a kind of a weird place where we have to say, oh wait, yeah, we're using this for something different now. Whereas we actually have a choice to just use something different. Uh, Roman, wait, um, how how far along are we with uh, Char to make uh, such a change? Start from the beginning. You were garbled a little bit. Okay. Uh, in the Char document. Uh, when I look at the, the status, it's still an ISG sort of like processing, so AD follow up. So it doesn't look like uh, okay, it needs four more yes. So I think it's still it's still in a place where it can change. Yeah, I mean, if if we if we need to make a change, I can pull it out of IESG yeah. review, give it back to the working group. It can be updated, and then we can bring it back. I'm not even sure it needs to be that traumatic. Uh, it may see other changes being folded in during the ISG processing. So that could be another one if the group uh, thinks that, that uh, that's a good idea. Yeah, if it's very small, we could do it that way as well. Yeah. I see George on a call. George uh, in the queue. George? Yeah, um, I think you may have just answered my question, but it was my question was more along the lines of how big a change to JAR is this right? I mean, JAR is trying to ensure that there's consistency in the object because, in that context, the request URI references something outside the AS, right? So, I mean, I think if it can be, you know, a very like a similar sort of concept to what Annabelle proposed here within JAR that basically says if the request URI is you know, effectively, if the entity generating the request URI is the same as the entity consuming the request URI, then, right, the the requirement of it of it pointing at a JWT, you know, doesn't stand or whatever. Um, 
I, I agree. It, it to Justin's point, it gets a little a little weird um, um, because how the request URI is being used is a little bit different, right? That's a little bit different of a semantic. Um, whereas in in par, it's more of a session. It's more of a session reference, right? Or, or an authorization reference, an authorization request reference, and um, which is a little bit different of a semantic than the request URI, um, which is basically telling the AS, go pull this object from some other site. Um, and it, to be completely clean, using Justin's suggestion to use another parameter name is probably the cleanest from a semantic perspective. I get nobody likes having extra parameters to parse and deal with. Well, how you guys, Justin is next. Um, okay, it sounded like there was a response to George. I don't want to say. I wanted to say something. Do I need to add to the queue as well or? Oh, go ahead. Or no. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so I personally would like to hear the opinion of implementers that already implemented PAR. I see Philippe is in the call. Anyone else that already has, already has implemented PAR hasn't no, I, done that? Uh, this is Justin. I've actually also implemented it, and, mm -hmm. and I'm already on the queue. Um, so in, in our implementation at Authly, we were able to reuse a lot of the machinery for doing request URIs, but the way that we managed this was kind of doing what Bell says in the text here in that we were able to recognize URIs that we know that we generated because we generated them. Um, and then we branch our, uh, we branch our processing based on that. Um, so it just so happens that our underlying data model uses all the same fields that a request object would, um, you know, you wouldn't have to do it that way. But the important thing is that the requirement of JAR ultimately is that the AS has to be able to understand what's at the other end of that URI. When it's not generated by the AS, that must be a JOT. When it is generated by the AS, we really don't care. The cleanest thing, apart from having a new parameter with newly defined semantics, would be to have jar fix that language. Now, I will also add that I believe um, my reading of the intentions of several bits of jar on uh, in conversations on the list with Nat, who I don't believe is on. Um, my understanding is that the intention was not to have it restricted for this kind of use case. It's just that this use case is completely outside of that. So there used to be language in JAR that it had to be um, an HTTP URL, for example. Um, or there was language that assumed that it was an HTTPS URL. Uh, specifically, even though it was defined as a URI, the assumption was that it was a URL. Um, so I, if we're able to tweak the language in JAR so that the requirements are conditional uh, in the way that Annabelle recommends here, we would be much better off than trying to backpatch that. And I'm with Hannes. I think that that is actually not changing the intention of the specification and you know modulo what the ad's say i think i would personally say that that fits within um this sort of late round edit because we're not we're not changing the requirement we're clarifying what we meant by the requirement okay philip Right, uh, Philip Skokan here. Um, as one of the one of the implementers, similar to what Justin just said, um, since this reuses the same parameter, I was able to reuse a lot of the existing 
um, middleware pipeline to, to process the request when it's part of a pushed authorization or authorization request endpoint or uh, um, or as the, the uh, regular authorization endpoint. I think that if it was just a different parameter, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But I would say keep the parameter name, fix the issue with a spec language. And I don't care which spec this gets fixed in because to me, it sounds like nitpicking. Any other comments? So, so maybe uh, maybe we need to discuss this with uh, Trusten and uh, sorry with um, with Nat and John and see what would it take to kind of uh, update the uh, the jar. Is that is that uh, that's one approach, I guess. Uh, and the, other, the other approach is just to update this document and uh, as this suggested here, right? So I, I mean, I, I, I agree with Brian and Philippe. So um, I think keeping the, the request the right parameter um, is a good idea, is less uh, disruptive, and I don't care where it's being fixed. Yeah, I think uh, a mail to the list with uh, the suggested wording uh, so that we can confirm this uh, with, on the list, which we have to do anyway, um, would be good. And then we can uh, take that step and uh, Roman can um, then sort of pass this along uh, to the ISG as they are making their reviews anyway. Right. Yeah. Thanks for um, saying that, Hannes. Yeah, I want to see the, the, the proposed kind of text uh, you know, in writing before I commit to us being able just to do this as a late stage edit versus kind of rerunning it through. So I like the, I like the approach you're suggesting, Hannes. Thanks. Hannes, what was your suggestion? Who is going to send what to the list? Um, I, I'm hoping that, uh, for example, you could send uh, uh, a text proposal to the list. Or is yes, this is the one that one of them has on, I, the, on the screen already sufficient? I mean, the, the, the one on the screen uh, was Annabelle's proposal for a text in part. Um, I, I assume the text would look a bit different if we would make a change to jar. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, mean, I can I can uh, get in contact with Nat and, and, and talk to him. Uh, what do you think about that? And. Uh, well, we have to dis bring this um, sort of post it to the list anyway, uh, where he and and everyone else sees it because it's not a, you know, it's not his document. It's it's the working group's document. Yeah, but still, I think what Torsten is saying, like you need to discuss it with Nat to see what's the best how the best way to do that change in in their document and then post it. Right, you don't want to just send something without consulting the editors, right? So, Thurston, is that is that your plan? You want to talk to? Yeah, I I just wanted to reach out to Ned. I mean, I had expected him to to attend today, but okay. um, he also commented on that exactly that uh, uh, topic um, in my slide deck. Um, I, I was just would just reached out to him and put, see out see whether we can sort it out quickly. So, I mean, okay, that's yeah. right. but it's still not a replacement for posting a mail to the list. Uh, yeah. Like this is the beginning, but and then after yeah. that he will do step, something. Hannes, here's my proposal. Step one, I talk to the editors, Ned and John. Step two is we come come up with a joint proposal. That will be my um, um, objective. And we post that to the list. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, cool. Good. Brian? Hey, hey, just so I can summarize to make sure I, I tr I'm tracking. So based on this conversation, the editors are going to chat how to synthesize it. They're going to put a proposal on the mailing list. The, the group can kind of talk about it. And from there, we can decide how to best, if at all, jam it into whatever document is required. Right? Yep. Okay. Next. Uh, Brian? Uh, oh. Pretty... Keep going. Yeah, no, never mind. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so next topic. Okay. Um, so there are, I think, two more topics. No, three topics. Um, question regarding time management to the chairs. Um, it's up to you, right? Like it's it's your call. So you, 
okay. uh, half halfway uh, half uh, through this meeting it's uh, it depends on how uh, how much time do you think you need for the other one, right? Yeah. I, I would I would uh, quickly flip flip over those uh, just to give people an impression, and then I think we have to handle it in a traditional way by sending uh, messages or posts to the list. So. Sounds good. Yeah. So uh, so three more topics. Uh, the first one is uh, can the AS require PAR? It was a topic uh, that Brian brought up uh, on the list recently. Um, which basically means, from my perspective, the AS is requiring uh, the request UI instead of a traditional request um, or authorization request, and additional also PAR. Um, yeah, as I said, we will uh, continue the discussion on the list for that because we already have a post on the list. Next topic is um, if an AS may require a request object. I mean, it's 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 a similar topic, right? Uh, what can the AS require uh, uh, regarding uh, client uh, functionality? Either the client may specify that it's only using request object, or there is an AS wide policy in place um, that enforces the same for a certain deployment or ecosystem. Um, there, there was a discussion in the OpenID Connect working group regarding a similar topic, and it was resolved by using uh, the client metadata parameter request object sign alg as a signal that the client wants to um, always use request objects. And we could, we could adopt the same solution or, or have a, two solutions for uh, two different aspects. And there is still the, 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 the question option whether there will be uh, a guidance needed on the request UI structure. So as I, as I said, I propose uh, we send um, um, posts to the list regarding those different topics and, and get your feedback, your thoughts and uh, contributions on that topic. Sounds good. All right. So I'm switching presentations. I assume you can see the other presentation now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. All right, rich authorization requests. The sister of the PAR. Um, what is it? Oh, well, basically, it's a way to specify, I would say, scopes uh, using JSON objects. So, what did the spec does? It, it adds a new parameter called authorization details, which contains an array of JSON objects. And each of, each of those JSON objects may contain authorization requirements for a certain type of resource or API. And each of those elements has a certain type or has to follow um, the definition of a certain type, which is indicated by the um, predefined data or element type. And basically the idea behind authorization details or rich authorization requests is that we would like to give clients a way to specify in a very detailed way their requirements regarding um, access to a certain API, which goes much beyond what a scope um, can do today. Um, from my perspective, the requirements behind um, a rich authorization request very much came from the open banking space and electronic signing, because we saw there that a simple scope is simply not sufficient. To, uh, to fulfill the requirements of, 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 those, um, of those areas. And on the right-hand side, you see an example of a request for uh, payment initiation, uh, which contains a lot of data that needs to be passed on and uh, consented uh, by the user. So uh, traditional so or solutions that have been implemented in the last couple of years typically use um, external resources capturing this kind of requirements and then link those re uh, resources in the request. With authorization details, I think we have a much better solution. And basically, and I will come to, back to that later on, authorization details is based on, on work that um, Justin um, has done in, in OAuth XYZ. So there is a, a similar uh, a structure in XYZ. Uh, I also contributed to that. So it's 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 kind of a backport of, of things that were done in XYZ 
to the OAuth space um, to, to leverage that functionality to OAuth clients. Um, the nice thing with a rich authorization request is that also different uh, authorization requirements for different resources can be combined in the same request. So in that case, for example, we've got a request for payment initiation, but also a request for access to account information, but you can mix and match other, other elements as well. And because it's structured, you can clearly delineate what data belong to what kind of um, request. And there is sort of there is a set of, of common elements, common data elements that are predefined by the uh, by the specification that help, for example, to to define what concrete resource a um, authorization requirement um, is related to. So you can say, okay, this this requirement for payment initiation goes to the resource located at example.com payments, whereas the account information is related to to another resource server, which also gives some indication regarding, uh, in the end, filtering of, of uh, authorization details that are attached to certain access tokens and uh, coming up with a solution for audience restricted access tokens. The authoriz authorization details parameter can be used basically everywhere where the scope parameter can be used. So in a traditional authorization request, in a push authorization request, um, in a CBAR request, in whatever, everywhere we can use um, the scope parameter, including the token request, uh, you can use a authorization um, details parameter. On the right-hand side, you see uh, a use of the authorization details in the context of a push authorization request. And in the end, push authorization request a bit was triggered by the word on rich authorization request because we we realized our requests authorization requests are getting much bigger and we need to way uh to to uh in a robust fashion in a secure fashion to convey this data to the authorization server so that's why par and rar perfectly um go together um all right um advantages uh, first of all, it's a flexible and type safe way to represent rich authorization data because it's structured, because we use JSON, but it's also type safe because there is an indicator or a identifier for the type. If you want, you could use the type field, for example, to, cut, to carry uh, the identifier of your, for example, JSON schema. Yeah. And um, in the end, that allows to really define structures for authorization uh, uh, details that are API or resource server specific. So there need that don't need to be a, a standard for, let's say, access to um, account information or health data or whatever, uh, or for our kind of access. Every application in the end, every API can define its own structure and pass it along. This comes at a cost because in the end, the authorization server needs to be able to interpret um, this data structures. But from my perspective, this uh, complexity already exists because the, the requirements already exist and the use case already exists. But the way the data were passed to the AS were different, um, homegrown in the last couple of years and more complex than what we now have with Power and Guard. We also have defined uh, some common data uh, elements, uh, first of all, to as a required elements, but also to address uh, common use cases. Yeah. All right, current status. Um, the draft already uh, also has been adopted by the working group. Here again, thank you very much for your support and uh, for voting in favor of the research authorization request uh, uh, spec. And um, in the same way as POWER, also, ROAR has been adopted by the OpenID Foundation's Happy Working Group as part, uh, part, uh, part of their baseline profile. And uh, there is there's, uh, um, some really good um, implementation experience right now. Um, the first point is because it's a backport from O of XYC, we also more or less leverage um, the experience that were drawn by implementing XYZ and, and different programming languages. And there's also product support, Authlead implemented ROAR already. And there's projects uh, using uh, ROAR. Um, so 
in the Novaritian e-health system it's being used, um, the before mentioned um, solution for electronic signature um, um, uses rubber. And I also have, have been informed that the Norwegian tax system uh, will be introducing RAR, uh, this atom, um, for um, authorization requests in the context of tax declarations for small and medium businesses. And um, yeah, again, also this mechanism uh, was proposed as part of HAPPY2 for adoption by the Australian Customer Data uh, Rights um, initiative. So there's a lot of things going on. And interestingly, also the uh, XOF proposal, which is the, the second proposal for the TXOF working group, also um, adopted uh, authorization details. So in the end, uh, it's coming back into the TXOF uh, initiative. In contrast um, to RAR, uh, to PAR, I think RAR needs a lot more work in this working group. So the base design works. This has been shown by the different implementations that has been conducted in the last couple of months, and also the previous work in the open banking space. But a lot of details <clears throat> need to be worked out. And as um, and Justin pointed out in, a, in one of our conversations, um, the difference between RAR and what XYZ does, um, RAR has also to, to handle scopes and, 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 and resource uh, indicators and so on. We'll come back to that uh, in the open topics or open um, issues. And I assume there might be a need for additional features based on implemental feedback. So for example, we uh, are in intensive discussions with um, the uh, people for, uh, in the Australian CDR initiative around also adding a grant management uh, uh, facility that in the end also um, has a relation to, to, to RAR because in the end, the authorization details will be part of the grants that the, that the user uh, consents to and the AS needs to manage. So here is a uh, not comprehensive list of open topics. Um, first, as I pointed out, interplay with scope, audience, the resource parameters and, and claims in the, in the, um, in the tokens uh, still needs more work. And I really ask um, anybody in the call to read the, the, the draft and, and give us feedback on that topic. Um, we need more text regarding that. And we also had some clarification. For example, um, Taka, Taka from, from Allfleet gave us very valuable feedback on, on especially on the use of the resource parameter in conjunction with uh, authorization details. But as I said, there is um, more work to do, and I hope to get more substantial feedback from uh, implementers. Then there is also, and that's, that's a similar topic, use of the authorization details uh, parameter in a token request to narrow down previously granted consent, uh, which makes a lot of sense, because uh, especially in, in used in conjunction with the off code flow, um, a client may ask for um, a lot of um, authorization details, but then narrow down a certain access token to a certain authorization detail scope. Um, the mechanism that we have right now in the spec is to use the resource parameter, because it's very handy just filter the authorization details for a certain, a certain resource level based on that. But in the end, uh, it might also be required to even further narrow down uh, the scope so that not only it's a audience restricted authorization uh, access token, but it also has limited privileges. And that's going to be um, a bit complex given the structure of authorization details. Then um, there is the question of required versus useful common elements. Um, the spec right now does not really distinguish clearly between those. I think the only thing we say is that type is a is a required parameter. Um, but we need to be more specific on that, and then uh, we need more feedback on that topic as well. Um, as RAR is 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 a backport of what has been done in X Y Z. Um, we should try and we need to try to keep an alignment between uh, RAR and TX off back and forth because there will be implementation experience on one side and there will be implementation experience on the other side. And we need to make sure that 
um, we really consider all those experiences in, in both places. Even if those are uh, living in different working groups, but since we have an overlap regarding the uh, authors and editors of those uh, specifications, I think we are very good prepared for that. Um, we also get um, the question of how um, schemas and versioning work with authorization details. And yes, we need, we need guidance on that. Uh, we already had discussed um, the topic of versioning um, and um, we came up with the conclusion that we don't need specific versioning support, but if an application wants to use different versions of a authorization details object, can use different type identifiers, um, including a kind of version identifier in the same way as most cases done with URLs. And there is another topic, the last on my list, and uh, we'll have another slide on that to, to in more in detail illustrate what the challenge is. And this is enrichment of authorization details in the token response. And the, the, basic, the basic idea behind that is that in the course of the authorization process, it might happen, and it happens, that the data in the authorization details object are being enriched either because the user decided something. For example, um, if you want to do a payment, the user, for example, uh, might have selected a account, or if the relying party wants to access certain accounts, the user might, select both, might have selected those. Or the AS uh, meets a policy decision. For example, how long is this uh, authorization details object going to be valid? And uh, the current idea, although it's not in its spec yet, is to, um, to allow the AS to um, provide the, the client with that enriched authorization details object, including all this data that were determined in the course of the authorization process. So the client has, the client has all the information that it needs to understand. The authorization um, or the access token and the, reg, and, the, the and, and, and the scope of the access and the, uh, the refresh token, and potentially also some data that in the end will be used to parameterize APIs. Here on the right left hand side, you see an authorization request for account information. It just says, I want to access the list of accounts. And yes, I want to um, have recurring access. And the, our assumption now is that in the course of the process, the user decided, OK, this, this client is going to get access to one of my um, um, current accounts and one of my um, credit cards. And the duration of this uh, authorization is, I think it's today. It might have been expired already. Yeah, we at Yesacom find out, found that very useful in the design of one of our APIs. And um, we think it makes sense to have that in the spec. And in the end, from my perspective, it's it's aligned with, uh, even with as, as text in RC6749, where the scope value, for example, is is uh, reflected in the token response if the AS modified the initial parameter value that were sent in the original uh, in the original authorization request. All right, that's it. Um, potentially, my co-authors want to chime in and raise other topics. Otherwise, I'm um, done with the presentation. Comments. George. Get off mute. Um, so, as you know, Torsten, I'm. I, I love this idea, and I'm actually looking to steal it for a couple of other things. Um, the the general concept. I think the interop part of it is going to be really difficult because it really feels like we're enabling fine grained authorization and everybody's fine-grained authorization model is different, right? So every AS is going to have a different set of types and accounts and things that are related to the transactions that they do. Um, so I think we're gonna have to be a little bit careful about what interop means. 
um, in that context and um, and allow that. But you know, and basic because effectively all you're really saying is I can send an authorization details in and I can get a response back. And as long as I'm doing whatever the AS knows about, right, it'll work, right? If I if I take a type from a different AS from AS1 and send it to AS2, the likelihood that AS2 will recognize that is small. Um, and I think it also puts the expectation that there's a lot more smarts in the client, right? OAuth2, you know, was trying to make the clients be somewhat dumb. Um, this requires the clients to actually have a, a high sub a high knowledge, especially if you're talking about mobile apps, a high knowledge of the fine-grained authorization model. None of that I, I think is a problem. I think we just have to be cognizant of that and set our expectations around interop accordingly. I fully agree. Um, basically, clients need to be need to be smarter in order to use that. My assumption is it's already there. What we do right now is we're trying to find a universal solution for that. And yes, the AS needs to know the type. Um, so my assumption is we have two, two different layers of interoperability. The first one is just the container. That's not that difficult, I think. And the other layer is on the level of the type. And for me, in my mental model, the type of authorization details object goes along with a certain API specification of a certain API and so on. So if that API is, for example, uh, being implemented by different deployments, then the ASs of those different deployments needs to understand. But I assume we need to clearly spell that out. Yes, I agree, right? I think we the two layers of interop, I think, are, are a good way to, to put that, right? So you, you may have, you may be able to define from a standards perspective, we have this set of interoperable like open banking APIs. And for those, we will define these set of types that you can use, right? And therefore we get interop across to an organization within that namespace, right? Or within that sort of problem vertical, right? And then other places may have other problem verticals with you know, their details, their detailed types. Um, but that should be left out of, spe out of scope from the RAR perspective. So I think we're in agreement there. I, I fully agree with you. Thank you. Okay, Justin. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, plus one to everything Forsen just said, but also that I think there are actually about two and a half layers of uh, of interop, and I'll explain why it's a half. Um, because in addition to defining the type, I do think it's both important and useful that we define uh, a set of sort of common dimensions to this um, uh, authorization request object that different APIs can reuse. Otherwise, we're just going to get into a space where people are saying the same thing in syntactically different ways for no good reason. Now, if you have a reason or you just want to define your own term and your own meaning for that term within your API, sure, I think we should allow that and the spec shouldn't restrict that. But I think that people are going to be looking for things like this is the set of URLs or URL patterns or something like that that I can use this on. Um, you know, these are the sets of verbs that I can use, you know, the read versus write type of things, uh, which we put under actions, I think it was called. Um, and so there's things like that that we can define that people can reuse if they want to. Now, Brian's raised a really um, good point in conversation, um, and that's the question of how do we define, uh, you know, how strictly do we define those terms uh, such that if I have a type and I want to redefine one of those common fields to mean something that's specific to my API, am I allowed to do that? That's one of the interop questions that this group is going to have to have a uh, concrete answer for. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with George that uh, interop for this is going to be 
um, difficult, but the layered approach is absolutely the way to go here because ultimately interoperability for this stuff is going to be defined by the APIs that it's protecting. Matt? Hi, this is uh, Matt from Coil. Um, yeah, Torsten th uh, and Justin, thanks for this um, this work. Uh, like, it, it's definitely, as somebody who tried to implement something um, with like access to accounts um, and trying to push it into scopes, it got ugly really quickly. Um, and that's sort of some of what I want to raise. Like, I'd be hesitant to add in layers of like being normative about this from like what certain actions are and stuff that um, Justin was bringing up purely from the perspective that like, I think that should be done at a higher like level, like something like open ID could do if they wanted to do that. The, the reason being is like, I just don't think that like if a lot of the cases that are going to use this are going to be very specific anyway. And if you look how people are implementing all, like there's very few things that they would be doing where it requires this complexity where things are going to be uniform across the whole stack. Um, and that, yeah, I, I would just say, be cautious about trying to add too much, too much normative language in here. Like I, like already being like using this, you'd probably be doing like custom stuff already at, at that level. Um, and I think then that layer of like people developing sort of what you'd call like AS level schemes for authorization details, those ASs can be interoperable if they all understand what they're asking for. And that's fine. Okay. I think uh, the, the queue is empty now. Uh... Do you want to, uh, Torsten, maybe summarize uh, and wrap up, or do you have anything else that you want to discuss? Um, thank you very much for your for your for your feedback, and um, I would like to ask anybody in the call, um, especially Matt, um, to give um, the current version of the draft a thorough review and um, help us to really clearly draw this line um, between what should go into a OAuth spec and uh, what should be kept outside. I think we already tried to really draw the line very, very precisely and kept everything that is API specific in an example section that's in the appendix. Um, but uh, more feedback um, would be very, very appreciated and, and valuable. And that's it for my side. I think Brian, Brian, Justin, do you want to say something? Some last words as co-authors? Um, no, I'm good. You've, you've covered the main points that I care about. Thank you. Okay. Brian, anything? I'm, I'm good now. Thanks. Okay, then uh, I think uh, we're done for today. That was good. Uh, thanks, Torsten. Appreciate that. And um, we'll see you next week, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.